So, uh, Father Ferris gave his first lecture in December of 2013, and it was just a few months after we started this whole thing. And it's my wife's favorite lecture. So congratulations. <laughs> it's also one of my favorites. Uh, I listened to it last week as an introduction to, uh, to Advent for my own personal prayer life. Uh, there are a few back there. It's on um, St. Athanasius' work on the Incarnation. And it is a wonderfully um, uh, prayerful and reflective talk and will give you a lot to ponder. Uh, Father has a, a very good gift for giving talks for this season. I imagine it might be good in Lent, too. So you have that reflective, you know, <laughs> genuine voice and you know, soothing. And, you know, it, it's good. It's good. So uh, tonight he's going to speak on the poems of St. John of the Cross um, to help us prepare for um, a, a good Advent and, and Christmas to come up. So uh, if you don't know who Father Ferris is, he's a priest in the diocese. He's stationed uh, at St. Michael's in Remus. And he was homeschooled. Yes, homeschooled. And uh, did his undergraduate studies at Seton, uh, Seton Hall. Sorry. He, uh, and then he went to the seminary and uh, had that education at Mundelein. So um, please welcome Father Ferris. Let us begin in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, as we prepare for the birth of your Son and celebrate the great mystery of the Incarnation, we ask that you pour out your Spirit upon us to prepare our hearts to receive him with joy, to stir up longing within us that we might rejoice when he comes to us in lowliness and in glory. We ask this through Christ, who is your Son, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. I grew up going to Mass at the Carmelite Monastery out in Parnell. And so the Carmelites have always had a deep place in my life. I don't know about your own experiences, but I know John of the Cross for many reasons, but most people know John of the Cross because of the terms the Dark Knight or the Dark Knight of the Soul. And if that's why you know him, you will be disappointed. We will not be talking about that tonight. Rather, it's the season of Advent. And he has three poems, well two in particular though, that really I believe help us enter into the season and prepare for Christmas. First is poem, which is a gloss on Psalm 137, Superflumina Babylonis. And then his poem, Romances. Those are the two we will cover tonight. There is a third, the spiritual canticle, that goes well with these as well, but it's just too much for one night. Before we get into the poetry, we need a picture of the man. And here's a, a lengthy quote from a recent biography. In appearance, Juan de la Cruz, John of the Cross, was a very small man, with dark hair and complexion, a face rather round than long, and a slightly aquiline nose. His glance, we are told, was gentle. He grew a slight beard and went bald early. But of his character, it is more difficult to speak. Like Teresa, he was singularly devoid of all those vivid and arresting features that one calls personality. You see an inward-looking man, silent, with downcast eyes, hurrying off to hide himself in his cell, and so absent-minded that he often did not take in what was said to him. We know the immense tenacity of purpose that underlay his somewhat feminine sensibility, his strictness in matters of discipline, and his entire and wholehearted devotion to the contemplative life. Perhaps no one ever had a vocation that drew him so irresistibly. He had also, as Teresa observed, plenty of common sense, and an insight into character and events that prevented him from being taken in, and often allowed him to foretell the future. A singularly amazing man. St. John of the Cross was born Juan de Yepes y Alvarez in, 1450, in 1542 in Fontevero, Spain. His father was from a middle-class family, but was ostracized because he married below his station. 
And when Juan was only a few months old, his father died. Juan was the youngest of three boys. A few years later, the middle brother, Luis, died, and Juan was sent to an orphanage where he'd be fed, clothed, and given a basic education, and ideally prepared for a trade. And he was terrible at the trades. He found his place as, as a sacristan in a nearby convent, and there his gifts for the priesthood were recognized and his education for the priesthood began. He was offered a chance to be a priest, a chaplain at the nearby hospital, but he fled the world and entered the Carmelite Priory, taking the name Fray Juan de San Matias, Brother John of St. Matthias. He continued his education in Salamanca until he was ordained in 1567. And that's important, that education at Salamanca, because it was flourishing academically and artistically. Spain, after it had driven out the Moors in 1492, Spain, Christian Spain, was flourishing culturally, economically. And Salamanca was one of the hearts of that flourishing. There, John would learn the Latin masters, Virgil and Cicero. He'd be well grounded in Aquinas and Augustine. And he'd also be familiar with the literature of his day, even the secular literature, particularly the medieval romances, which is important for understanding John. Romances. They're not the romance novels of today, which are just good for fuel and fire. No, the chivalric romances, the medieval romances, the stories of knights and the high adventures, courtly love, King Arthur and his Knights of the Round Table, Lancelot, the ones we are most familiar with. Those stories, that pattern of life, would deeply influence John. This coincided well with his own sensitive nature, his love of nature and of beauty. As a brother, he would spend whole days in a forest or by a long stream or simply looking out upon the mountains in the distance. His love of nature, God's great gift to mankind. And when he would become prior of a monastery, he would often take the brothers on such excursions that they might encounter the wonder and the beauty of God's creation. A truly heartfelt soul, but a sensitivity also tied to great austerity. It's because of his great love for asceticism that John would join the reform of the Carmelite order. And St. Teresa began in 1560. The Carmelite orders had fallen into laxity after Pope Eugenius IV had given them a milder ruler in the 15th century. And Teresa recognized the dangers of this reform and saw the need for a return to the primitive observance, placing an emphasis on poverty, strict enclosure, fasting, and prayer. John was attracted to this, this asceticism, indeed partly because of his love and his sensitive nature. Indeed, the whole project is one of love. As that other great Carmelite saint, the little flower, will remind us centuries later, the sublimation of desires through asceticism focuses the mind and the heart and the will on the one person, in a passionate pursuit of that one person who can satisfy. It is always a great work of love. John would take the habit of that reform in 1568, about a year after being ordained a priest. But driven by love, might sound good, but his life in the reform would not be easy. First, the challenges of starting a new religious community, but more importantly, the antipathy of the larger Carmelite order that did not want to be reformed. How true that always is. And the tensions would rise, often around quite mundane or political things. But after nine years of the reform, the Carmelite friars would take John of the Cross, capture him, and imprison him for nine months, first in Avila, then in Toledo. John was imprisoned in a cell measuring six feet by ten feet. The only light was from a small hole three fingers wide set high in the wall, which meant the only way he could pray his breviary 
would be to stand on his bed at midday to catch enough light to read by. He wore the same clothes for nine months, which rather quickly became infested with lice. He was fed scraps of bread and sardines, which gave him dysentery. Beginning three times a week and then going down to once a week, John would be taken to the refectory to eat that bread and sardines from the floor while being abraded and abused by the friars. There was a verbal humiliation seeking to draw him away from the reform and the physical abuse of being caned by each of the brothers on his shoulders. This lasted for nine months until through a series of miracles and indeed the kindliness of one of the jailers, John was able to escape. And that's where I'm going to end the account of his life and personality because it's that imprisonment at Toledo where John writes and begins to write the poems we'll cover tonight. And really there's much more that can be said about John but there are simply changes in details. The sufferings, the love that he experienced throughout his life, they are repeats of this one experience. What matters for us is the intensity of this sensitive man. This man of God who loved asceticism and suffering and who endured much in his passionate pursuit of God. And his prison poetry. That's what we are covering tonight. And rather this is fitting for Advent. We who find ourselves in exile in this land, beset by darkness, spiritual imprisonment. It's a penitential season. Yes, one marked by hope, one marked by a vision for the future. But still a time of darkness and exile and suffering. Now there is one challenge, particular challenge, when we deal with John's poetry. He wrote in 16th century Spanish, which is a far cry from our contemporary English. And all the lyrical quality of his poetry is in Spanish, not in English. Much is lost in the translation. But the poems do remain profound expressions of those deep longings for God. Yes, the embrace of asceticism and suffering, but the deep hope and longing for God that empowers John through all of it. Because we are in the season of Advent, this is most appropriate. That longing, that desire, that anticipation for Christ. So we're going to begin. First, with his gloss on Psalm 137. Super flumina Babylonis. The psalm itself is a lament by the Israelites who are in captivity in Babylon. After Jerusalem has been destroyed, the Israelites are deported. And by their captors in Babylon, they are mocked and abused in order to get the people to assimilate, to leave their former way of life and become one with the people of Babylon. Their religious sensibilities in particular are mocked because what marked the people were the gods they worshipped. That's what gave each nation, each people, its identity. And so the Babylonians sought to remove that separation destroying their sensibilities and getting them to assimilate. So Psalm 137. By the rivers of Babylon, we sat mourning and weeping, and we remembered Zion. On the poplars of that land, we hung up our harps. There our captors asked us for the words of a song, our tormentors for a joyful song. Sing for us a song of Zion, but how could we sing a song of the Lord in a foreign land? If I forget you, Jerusalem, let my right hand wither. May my tongue stick to my palate if I do not remember you. If I do not exalt Jerusalem beyond all my delights. Remember, Lord, against Edom that day at Jerusalem. They said, level it, level it down to its foundations. Fair Babylon, you destroyer. Happy those who pay you back the evil you have done us. Happy those who seize your children and smash them against a rock. A profound cry of lament. They're being mocked and humiliated, asked to sing one of the songs of Israel, probably the songs of ascent. 
They were the songs of joy and praise that the Israelites would sing as they journeyed together up to Jerusalem. Psalms 120 through 134. Songs praising God for His great victory, for His blessings upon the people. Songs of joy in gathering as God's people in His presence. And the Israelites, in the face of the mockery then, ask God for His vengeance. And they pronounce a blessing on those who will destroy Edom and Babylon. And it makes sense why this would be a great source poem for John and his imprisonment. Captured by the Carmelite fires, physically and verbally abused, mocked about his fidelity to God, his pursuit of God, tempted, pushed, forced to assimilate, to turn away from the way God had laid out from before him. And for us in Advent, beset by darkness in a world that seeks to tell us that consumerism is the way to assimilate, to go with the crowd, that mocks what we believe in our fidelity to Christ, exiled in a world, our hope, as Job will tell us, is that our vindicator lives. And so John writes a gloss, a poem, based on this Psalm 137. By the rivers of Babylon I sat down weeping. There on the ground, and remembering you, O Zion, whom I loved. In that sweet memory I wept even more. I took off my feast day clothes and put on working ones. I hung on the green willows all the joy I had in song putting it aside for that which I hoped for in you. There love wounded me and took away my heart. I begged love to kill me since it was so wounding me. I threw myself in its fire, knowing it burned, excusing now the young bird that would die in the fire. I was dying in myself, breathing in you alone. I died within myself for you, and for you I revived because the memory of you gave life and took it away. The strangers among whom I was captive rejoiced. They asked me to sing what I sang in Zion. Sing us a song from Zion. Let us hear how it sounds. I said, how can I sing? In a strange land where I weep for Zion, singing of the happiness that I had there. I would be forgetting her, if I rejoiced in a strange land. May the tongue I speak with cling to my palate if I forget you in this land where I am. Zion, by the green branches, Babylon holds out to me. May my right hand be forgotten that I so loved when home in you. If I do not remember you, my greatest joy, or celebrate one feast day or feast at all without you, O daughter of Babylon, miserable and wretched, Blessed is he in whom I have trusted, for he will punish you as you have me. He will gather his little ones, and me, who wept because of you, and the rock who is Christ, for whom I abandoned you. A man deep in passionate love for Zion a love for that communion with God and God's presence. By the rivers of Babylon I sat down weeping. And there on the ground, remembering you, O Zion, whom I love, in that sweet memory I wept even more. John, who loved those open places, who loved nature as a place of communion with God, who loved the peace of his cell that he might encounter the intimacy of God's love. He's been cast to the ground. Separated from Zion, he longs for his great love and he weeps. I took off my feast day clothes and I put on working ones. Filthy clothes, nine months of rags and lice and disease. I hung on the green willows all the joy I had in song. Putting it aside for that which I hoped for in you. 
he is being tortured. He has to lay aside his joy. He will not lay aside, though, his hope, his longing to return to Zion, to live the reform for him, to live in that path, that communion with God that God has set out before him. He will not give in to the pressures to turn away. Yes, he is lost in a land of sorrow. He weeps and suffers. But he will not give up hope in the vindication of God's love. The strangers among whom I was captive rejoiced. They asked me to sing what I sang in Zion. Let's hear how it sounds. I said, how can I sing in a strange land where I weep for Zion, seeing of the happiness I had there? I would be forgetting her if I rejoiced in a strange land. First off, the honesty. John does not put on a nice smile over his suffering. He is weeping. Nine months of abuse. Nine months of trying to be forced to assimilate, to join, to repudiate the reform. But he will not turn away from God. For the riches of the world, for the comforts, the pleasures the false promises. How vital is this for us in this great season of Advent? For indeed, Advent points out to us, in the midst of the darkness of the world, the false promises that our world offers to us and all the pressures that it places on us. All the enticements and the alluring desires that it places before us to draw us away from God and back to the world. As much as we all probably dislike the consumerism of the season, actually I believe it is in its own way an ironic blessing from God. Because there is no better expression of the darkness of this world than the ridiculous promise that a new television set will bring you happiness. Or a new car, or a diamond bracelet, or whatever it is they're trying to sell. It's ridiculous on its face, yes, but it's also more laughable because They've been making the exact same promise every year for decades. And every year people have bought a new TV and still are miserable. <laughs> the temptations haven't changed. The lies haven't changed. They're the promises made to John to turn away from the reform. The promises made to the Israelites for them to abandon their God. That it will be better. That you'll be happy and satisfied. And yet the promises are empty. Our hope, our only hope, indeed our deepest longing, is in Zion, in God. And John knows the emptiness of these promises. O daughter of Babylon, miserable and wretched. Blessed is he in whom I have trusted, for he will punish you as you have me. And you will gather his little ones and me who wept because of you at the rock who is Christ, for whom I abandoned you. O daughter of Babylon, miserable and wretched. How miserable and wretched are the promises of this world. They cannot fulfill one. They are really a headlong rush into emptiness. And John's response to this though, is important. He doesn't condemn. He leaves them to the judgment of God. Indeed, he weeps for them because they're miserable and wretched. He mourns for the world and its false promises. Which should also be our response. My brothers and sisters around us are miserable and wretched. Amidst the trappings of wealth and comfort and ease, there is no wholeness or fulfillment or satisfaction. John pities his captors as we should pity the world in which we live. And an important reminder, for in our world today, especially for Catholics, there is one grave ill that is so easy to fall into. The sickness of cynicism. 
Cynicism is a false joy rooted in pride. It doesn't answer the problems of the world. It simply condemns them and rejoices in the sufferings of others. John has no time for this. His joy isn't in anyone or anything of this world. He's suffering enough in his prison cell. He has no energy to waste on cynicism. He pities the wretches caught in the promises of this world. And then he turns his attention back to God who will be his vindication. Who is the sure rock, the foundation of his life. He hands the world over to Christ to let him deal with them. He has abandoned everything for Christ. that complete and total dedication. God is what matters, not His tormentors, not the pressures, not the world, not the sufferings. What matters is His God. And that's what will come out in the second poem, quite vividly. The second poem, titled Romances, it's often considered by the experts one of his lesser poems. First, because they say its lyrical quality is not that good. I am no judge of 16th century Spanish poetry, so I cannot tell you that. But they also claim that its content, its doctrinal content, makes it one, makes it one of his lesser poems. And this is where I think they are dead wrong. Indeed, it's his doctrinal content that makes the poem so profound coming out of the Enlightenment and the resurgence of classical literature, there's often, has been often, a focus in poetry simply on the experiential, the pastoral, especially in literature since the 19th century to our day. Truth and the objective have become secondary to the experience and the subjective. And yes, there's been beautiful poetry coming out of this, but it so often falls into self-aggrandizing reveries. John takes his cue from the beauty, and the power, and the story, the romances of his day, the chivalric romances, the courtly love, and the adventures of knights errant, to manifest the power, the goodness, the truth, the beauty of God and his love. And indeed, one might say doctrine is the highest poetry, because doctrine is all about the love of God for us. And John reveals that beauty in the romances. And for us in Advent, really it is the great exercise of Advent, which is a contemplation. A contemplation that ought to lead to a growing longing and desire for God. A contemplation by which we fix our minds and hearts upon the mystery of God and what He has done and what He is called to do. That our hearts might be ready to welcome Christ when He comes. Romances begins with a gloss on the first chapter of the Gospel of John. I won't do the whole poem tonight, it's a very long poem, but I will do a good chunk of it. In the beginning, the Word was. He lived in God and possessed in Him His infinite happiness. That same word was God, who was in the beginning. He was in the beginning and had no beginning. The word was called Son. He was born of the beginning, but always conceived Him, and was always conceiving Him. Giving of His substance always, yet always possessing it. And thus the glory of the Son was the Father's glory. And the Father possessed all His glory in the Son, as the lover and the beloved, each lived in the other. And the love that unites them is one with them, they're equal, excellent as the one and the other. Three persons and the other, three persons and one beloved among all three. You'd be hard pressed to find a more beautiful or succinct expression of Augustine's vision of the Trinity. 
I certainly think Dr. Marshall could not do it that quickly. God is an intimate communion of love. The lover, the beloved, and the love that unites them, distinct and yet intimately one. God has always been giving of His substance, and yet always possessing it. And thus the glory of the Son was the Father's glory. And the love that unites them is one with them. The very essence of God is this unity of love. Three persons, one being. There probably is no better way to express this great mystery that drove John than poetry. In that immense love, proceeding from the two, the Father spoke words of great affection to the Son. Words of such profound delight that no one understood them. They were meant for the Son, and He alone rejoiced in them. What He heard was this, My Son, only your company contents me. And when something pleases me, I love that thing in you. Who wherever resembles you most, satisfies me most. And whoever is like you in nothing will find nothing in me. I am pleased in you alone, O life of my life. My son, I will give myself to him who loves you, and I will love him with the same love I have for you, because he has loved you, whom I love so. No great lovers of this world, no passionate lovers of this world could ever say more could ever express their love more deeply than the Father for His Son. Only your company contents me. And when something pleases me, I love that thing in you. Whoever resembles you most satisfies me most. My Son, I will give myself to Him who loves you, and I will love Him with the same love I have for you. because He has loved you, whom I love so. The impetus for creation. The love of the Father for the Son is to be manifest so that the Son might be loved by others. Not as much as the Father can love the Son, but as much as possible. Creation. So the Father might love the Son by loving those who love the Son and those whom the Son loves. My Son, I wish to give you a bride who will love you. Because of you, she will deserve to share your company and eat at your table the same bread I eat, that she may know the good I have in such a Son. Rejoice with me in your grace and fullness. My son, I wish to give you a bride. Truly the theme of all of Scripture, that God is a bridegroom, betrothing to Himself His people, so that she may know the good I have in such a son, and rejoice with me in your grace and fullness. Love is not exclusive or possessive. Indeed, it is the sign of an immature love, that it is jealous of others loving the beloved. If we truly love someone, then we would desire that the whole world would adore our beloved as much as we do. God is the greatest lover. He wants others to love His Son and to rejoice in the grace and the fullness of His Son and to share in the life of our beloved. The son responds with equal fervor. I am very grateful. I will show my brightness to the bride you give me, so that by it she may see how great my father is. I will hold her in my arms, and she will burn with your love and with eternal delight. She will exalt your goodness. I will show my brightness to the bride that by it she may see how great my Father is. 
Yes, man exists to be the bride of the sun. That is the true longing of this great season of Advent. That we are to be the bride of the Son of God. To see the brightness of the sun, the refulgence of the Father's glory. To know how great the Father is. To burn and to long for God. And to exalt in His goodness. That's what we and all of creation were made for. To be part of the greatest love that ever was. Creation is a love story. But it's not a love story first about God's love for us. It is first the story of God's love for His Son. And God invites us to be a part of His story of love. And again, this is coming from a man who for nine months was being tortured and beaten and starved on a regular basis. It is this phenomenal mystery of love and that great longing for God that allows him to say no to Babylon. To say no to the temptations of the world. Because they cannot match his longing and his desire for this profound love of God. Let it be done then, said the Father, for your love has deserved it. And by these words the world was created, a palace for the bride, made with great wisdom and divided into rooms, one above, the other below. The lower was furnished with infinite variety, while the higher was made beautiful with marvelous jewels, that the bride might know the bridegroom she had. Creation, John's love for creation. It is the palace God made for his bride, for us. The rich variety of the world and the jewels of the heavens. They are the many treasures that manifest the infinite beauty and the loveliness of God. So that the bride might know the bridegroom she had. So that the love and the power and the goodness of God may be made manifest. And again, not for our own sakes, but so that we might love the Son. God did not make this for us. He made it for us so that we might love the Son. That we might rejoice in Him. It is the Father's delight in His Son that won for us the great gifts of creation the infinite variety of the world in which we live, and the jewels in the heavens, to entice us, to draw us to the love of the Son and His Father. It is a dowry. And indeed it is this bridal language that so vividly sets us in Advent. That great saint of Advent, St. John the Baptist, the friend of the bridegroom, who goes before the bridegroom preparing the way, crying out in the desert, making straight the paths for the one who is to come. That bridal imagery again that is at the heart of our relationship with God, and God's relationship with us. The Old Testament tells us repeatedly that Israel is God's bride. Yes, often an errant, willful, and treacherous bride, but still his bride. And with our forefathers in faith, Advent becomes truly that season of engagement, the season of preparation and longing for the intimate union of God and man in Jesus Christ. As much as a young bride longs for the embrace of her husband, as much as a groom may yearn for union with his bride, so the season of Advent is our time to grow in that longing. That longing for the coming of God in Christ and intimate communion with Him. He is not explicit in any way, and yet it is some of the most erotic poetry possible. Those higher ones possessed the bridegroom in gladness, 
the lower in hope founded on that faith that he infused in them, telling them that one day he would exalt them and he would lift them up from their loneliness so that no one could mock it anymore, for he would make himself holy like them. And he would come to them and dwell with them. And God would be man and man would be God. And he would walk with them and eat and drink with them and he himself would be with them continually until the consummation of the world. When joined, they would rejoice in eternal song, for he was the head of this bride of his to whom all the members of the just would be joined who formed the body of the bride. He would take her tenderly in his arms and there give her his love. And when we were, they were thus one, he would lift her to the Father, where God's very joy would be her joy. For as the Father and the Son and he who proceeds from them live in one another, so it would be with the bride. For taken wholly into God, she will live the life of God. He would take her tenderly in his arms and give her his love. In the intimacy of the marital embrace, in the longing that is at the heart of all mankind. Indeed, it is that upon which our humanity was founded. Adam and Eve start in faith and hope, and they look forward to that intimate consummation with God and the promise that he would exalt them, and that he would lift them from their loneliness. Because God would be man, and man would be God, and he would walk with them, and eat and drink with them, until the consummation of the world. John tends to be Franciscan in his theology on the Incarnation, for which I have to forgive him. That the Incarnation would have happened regardless of man's sin. Yet if there really is an argument for that, it is his description of this profound love and plan of God. God created man lower than the angels that by hope and faith man might yearn for God. That might, he might yearn even more and more for the coming of the bridegroom. So that God would in time come and unite himself to the bride. Completely and intimately. And the two would become one. And the bride would share with the bridegroom in that tender embrace. And in the very joy and ecstasy of the Father. In the very life of God. This is the most audacious claim of Christianity. Even the Incarnation on its face is not as audacious as this. But to claim that man can live in such intimate communion with God. And it is the essential claim of the season. The essential claim of longing that is meant to drive our lives in God. Advent is not just about the darkness of the world the darkness of sin and the power set against us. But it is the suffering and the longing that it's desire for God. Indeed, what might seem a greater torment, the powers set against us from the outside, or the burden of hope, unfulfilled hope for years. By this bright hope, though, which came to them from above, their wearying labors were lightened. But the drawn out waiting and their growing desire to rejoice with their bridegroom wore on them continually. A light, yes, hope, but also a burden. So with prayers and sighs and sufferings, with tears and moanings, they asked night and day that now he would determine to grant them his company. Some said, if only, this joy would come in my time. Others, come Lord, send him whom you will send. And others, oh, if only these heavens would break. And with my own eyes I could see him descending. 
And then I would stop my crying out. O clouds, rain down from your height. Earth needs you, and let the earth open, which has borne us thorns. Let it bring forth that flower that would be its flower. Others said, what gladness for him who is living then, who will be able to see God with his own eyes and touch him with his hand, and walk with him and enjoy the mysteries which you will then ordain. The longing of hope, the desire of our forefathers, desire for the intimate communion with the bridegroom, in these and other prayers a long time had passed. But in the later years, their fervor swelled and grew when the aged Simeon burned with longing and begged God that he might see this day. And so the Holy Spirit, answering the good old man, gave him his word that he would not see death until he saw life descending from the heights until he took God himself into his own hands and holding him in his arms, pressed him to himself. Simeon, the other great image of the season, the culmination of the desires of the Israelites, burned with longing, the culmination of the centuries of longing. And he received the promise that he would not see death until he saw life descending from the heights, until he took God himself into his own hands, and holding him in his arms, pressed him to himself. The great paradox, the infant, the infant who is infinity dwindled to infancy, that aged Simeon might press him to himself. Now that the time had come when it would be good to ransom the bride, the father with tender love spoke in this way. Now you see, son, that your bride was made in your image, and so far as she is like you, she will suit you well. Yet she is different in her flesh, which your simple being does not have. In perfect love this law holds that the lover become like the one he loves. For the greater their likeness, the greater their delight. Surely your bride's delight would greatly increase were she to see you like her in her own flesh. My will is yours, the son replied, and my glory is that your will be mine. This is fitting, Father what you, the Most High, say, for in this way your goodness will be more evident. Your great power will be seen and your justice in wisdom. I will go and tell the world, spreading the word of your beauty and sweetness and of your sovereignty. I will go see my bride and take upon myself her weariness and labors, in which she suffers so, and that she may have life, I will die for her. And lifting her out of that deep, I will restore her to you. The incarnation. The central, one of the central mysteries of our faith. So much so that during the creed we bow or bend our knees to profess our faith in this phenomenal mystery. Which is not, first and foremost, about us and our salvation. Yes, it comes through the Incarnation. But first and foremost, Jesus takes flesh in obedience to His Father's will and to manifest the glory and the goodness and the power and the justice and the wisdom of God. It is not our selfish understanding that God did this for us. Jesus does this for His Father. That we might love the Son and in loving the Son we might love the Father that the glory of the Father might be made manifest. And yes, we are saved in that love. In that love of Him, we are returned to our proper relationship with God, for which we were made. But it is first of all the love story of the Father and His Son that we are caught up into. 
This is why that model of the chivalric romances is so important. The love of a knight for his lady. That love that sends the knight out on adventures. The knight wears a token of his lady's affection so that by all his victories, the glory of the lady is increased. And Christ is that knight who takes on our humanity in order to manifest the glory of God and in to increase our love for Him. Yes, to save us. But it is not first about us. It is first that we might love God in the Son. When the time had come for Him to be born, He went forth like the bridegroom from His bridal chamber embracing his bride, holding her in his arms, whom the gracious mother laid in a manger among some animals that were there at that time. Men sang songs and angels' melodies, celebrating the marriage of two such as these. And God there in the manger cried and moaned, and these tears were jewels, the bride brought to the wedding. The mother gazed in sheer wonder at such an exchange. In God, man's weeping, and in man, gladness. To the one and the other, things usually so strange. But God, there in the manger, cried and moaned, and these tears were jewels the bride brought to the wedding. The mother gazed in sheer wonder on such an exchange. In God, man's weeping, and in man, gladness. To the one and the other, things usually so strange. The paradoxical relationship of God and his people. That bridal imagery of God stepping forth as the groom from the bridal chamber to embrace his bride. And he is in turn held by her. He whom all creation cannot contain embraces his bride so intimately that in all truth he is held by her and they are one. And Mary cradling her infant next to her breast, it is probably the most tender image in all of history and yet the most profound reality of all. For in her arms is the consummation of the union of bride and groom the union of heaven and earth, the sweetest embrace of all, man embracing God, embracing man. And in the face of this reality, what can one do? Men sing, angels proclaim sweet melodies, and the whole of creation, from the lowest beasts to the highest creatures in the heavens, exalt the wondrous God, manifest in a tiny infant child. And that infant cries. The cries and tears of this child are the wedding gift of the bride who has longed for ages for the coming of her groom. The moans and the sufferings of the precious gems that have drawn forth the groom from his bridal chamber. The longings of human hearts that have called upon God to come amongst his people. And Mary can only gaze and wonder at this reality. The face of God covered in tears, and man filled with gladness. Man lost in darkness, with longing for ages untold. Now filled with the very joy of God. The gifts that have brought the bridegroom and the consummation of all our human longings. I know of no better way to prepare for Christmas. There is a third poem in Spiritual Canticles, but it really is a reflection on the Song of Songs, which is this whole bridal imagery played out. But for tonight, I will leave you with this. The joy of the Father and the Son, the joy of the Son and the Father, and their mutual joy in drawing us into that love. The tears on the face of God, and the gladness of God,
at the heart of our being. Thank you.